Australia. It's good to be with you again. The days go by so fast. The years fly by. Your life flies by. Before you know it, you'll be out of your body. And where will you be? Where will you be? This is determined by what you know. If you know who you are, you will be nowhere. If you think you know who you are, you will be somewhere. Where we go is dependent on our thoughts. The mind is the same even after death, so-called. <clears throat> Your thoughts determine where you go. As an example, if you believe in heaven and hell, if you believe in hell and one in heaven, you will find yourself after you leave your body in a hellish situation. But you have created that situation. Nobody sends you there. There's no one to send you anywhere. And you create the place you go by what you know. If you believe you deserve to go to heaven, you'll find yourself in a heavenly place. But that's only for a short time. And then the law of karma takes over and brings you where you're supposed to be. You may incarnate in this planet again. You may go to a different planet. So, the smart person doesn't want to go anywhere. The smart person never dies because the smart person was never born. There's nowhere to go and there's nothing to do. You just merge into consciousness. You become consciousness. You become omnipresence. And you're always happy. So for a yani, there's no birth and there's no death. There's no coming, there's no going. There's absolutely nothing. But the nothing I'm referring to is called bliss consciousness. The nothing I'm referring to is you don't lose your individuality. Your individuality expands and becomes omnipresence. And now you may ask the question, how can everybody's individuality expand in the same way? <clears throat> and then there'll be explained of individualities. No. There's only one individuality. And that one is the self. And that one is you. You are the ultimate reality. But right now with your finite mind, it's difficult to comprehend that. And this is why you have to understand that you are not your body-mind phenomena. As soon as you get rid of the body-mind concept, you become free. Therefore, you work on yourself. The spiritual sadhana that you do is simply to awaken. 
to awaken to yourself, to the one reality. In the one reality, you can have a body or not have a body. It makes no difference. But even if you have a body, you really don't have a body. The body only appears to the non-yani. It appears as if the yani has a body. It appears as if the yani is doing something. But the yani does nothing. The yani is immersed in consciousness and has become the self, the total reality, the pure intelligence, the absolute awareness, the Satchitananda. Many people ask me this question. So what I'll do is I'll ask you the question. And the question is this. If it's true that everything is predetermined, in other words, when I lift my arm like this, that has been predetermined. If that is the truth, what does it matter what I do? <clears throat> what if I kill someone, or cheat someone, or rob someone? What difference does it make if I eat meat or I don't? If everything is predetermined, I'm going to do it anyway. So why should I behave myself? Who can tell me? From the teachings, who can tell me that? What's the answer? Guess. But it, could you say that it, it just delays? It delays the in, in awakening because it creates more negative karma that has to be lived through. True. You're on the right track. Any more answers? By what you do now, you're creating a future predestined karma, so to speak. But if everything is predestined, what difference does it make? I, I don't know. I don't necessarily, necessarily accept what you're saying on that level. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm glad you don't. Your punishment is also destined, right, too. If you kill then the consequences are also there. Society kills you. doesn't really matter one way or the other. Okay. Any other bright answers? <laughs> well, if you don't... It can only make no difference if you know that it makes no difference. But if you don't know that it makes no difference, if you're under the, the bounds or the illusion that there is karma, it's going to make a difference. That's the answer. You're right. Exactly. If you have the consciousness of a yani, that question never comes up. It's only for the ayani that the question comes up. Because the ayani is bound by the Lord of Karma, Ishwara. <coughs> it's Ishwara who meets out your karma. As long as you believe you are the body, mind, consciousness, you're under the laws of karma. And anything I do to him comes back to me. I have to pay for everything. Whatever I do to somebody else, always comes back. So the average ayani, the non-yani, or the average person, is always accruing karma just by reacting. And this is why the only freedom you've got is to understand that you are not the body, 
and keep silent. Or not react to any condition. But that's not only physically, it's mentally. There are many people who sit in meditation posture for days, but their mind is going, 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 going. The mind never stops. The mind doesn't know the difference between the body taking action or the body not taking action. The mind moves by the very thoughts you have. It is only when the thoughts stop, when they cease, that the mind stops moving. And when the mind stops moving, all karma ceases. When there's no karma, you're out of the jurisdiction of the Lord of Karma, Ishwara. Ishwara no longer has any power over you. You have become Ishwara. And you're under no law. So there's nothing for you to do. And you're free. There is no longer birth or death for you. There's no longer any coming or going. Your actions become valueless. Because the action is only seen by the Ayani. In reality, the Yani takes no action. In other words, everything we see is an optical illusion. This is why the world this is why the world is a joke. A cosmic joke. Because the only thing permanent in the world is change. Everything changes continuously in this world, especially your thoughts. You know yourself, one minute you're thinking one thing, the next minute you're thinking something else. And somehow, if you want to find freedom and liberation in this life, you have to slow down your mind and stop your thoughts. It is your thoughts that keep you in bondage. The only thing your thoughts think about is the past and the future. But somehow you've got to get yourself to become centered in the moment and become totally spontaneous. I know it sounds sort of crazy when you think about it. Of course, you say to yourself, well, don't I have to plan for my future? Don't I have to learn lessons from my past? Don't I have to work toward my goal to achieve something in this world? Those are all human tendencies. It sounds very logical when you think about it. But notice what I said when you think about it. Now, what do you think would happen if you had no thoughts? I can assure you, your life would become better than it's ever been in the world. <clears throat> You'd have a better life than you've ever had in your life. Take that tree outside. 
and the tree can't think. And yet it's been there for hundreds of years, perhaps. All the leaves fall off, and no leaves grow. Let's take a seed, a rose seed. If a rose seed were able to think like us, I would probably say something like this. Do you mean to tell me that I'm going to turn into a beautiful rose? That sounds impossible. I'm just a little old seed. How can the seed become a rose? It doesn't sound logical. By those very thoughts, the seed would destroy itself. It would never become a rose. Because it cannot think, it turns into a rose by the laws of nature. In the same instance, when you think, what do you think about? You think about your bodily comforts. You think about food, and lodging, work, and money, health, and whatever. It's those very thoughts that keep you away from your highest good. If you are able to stop your mind from thinking, a mysterious power would take over. And you would find that you're in a better position than you've ever been in your life by not thinking. But every time you think, you worry, don't you? You worry about the future. You worry about Nancy and Nancy the man. You worry if your relationship is going to last, if you're going to get fired from your job, if this is going to happen, if that's going to happen. Those very thoughts cause those things to happen. Therefore, it behooves you to turn the mind within itself When the mind is turned within itself, it automatically rests in the heart center. And the heart center is nothing but consciousness. Consciousness is your true nature. Consciousness is omnipresence. Then you become like a gigantic screen, a gigantic universal movie screen. And all the images of the world and the universe are superimposed upon you. You awaken to the fact that you are the screen, or the screen is consciousness or pure awareness. And you realize that everything is a projection of your mind. That everything is the self. And you can truthfully say, everything that I behold is the self and I am that. So what do you think about that? I can't hear too good. Can I squeeze it here? Maybe a little bit or something. Come on. Are you comfortable with that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. After I finish talking, I was over. <laughs>
trade places? <laughs> I think I've seen you before. Yes. Uh, in the valley, and uh, there was a lady there who had kidney trouble. That's you. Yeah, <laughs> I recognize you. I didn't recognize you. Yeah, it's been a long time. Over. I know, probably a year. So. Yeah, yeah. How you been? Something happened a few weeks ago that what you're saying about is integrated. Now, you can't put it in words, but something did happen. I don't you can't put it I just can't say anything. So. See, this is the reason why I don't give lectures and I don't preach. Many people come and want to hear a lecture. They want to see a philosopher. I'm not a philosopher, I'm not a teacher, I'm not a lecturer. I'm nothing. And when I'm talking like this, I'm talking to myself. If you want to be part of myself, you're welcome. This is why this is called satsang. It is not the average meaning. I really don't know what it is. But as long as it helps you to awaken, that's all we're concerned with. Why I am sitting here and you're sitting there, I don't know. But there's no difference between me and you. I'm nobody special. You've asked me to sit here and talk, so that's what I do. But I don't talk too much. Because if I talk too much, you forget everything I said anyway. So I talk. Isn't that true? Most of you have read so many books. I've been to so many teachers that you don't know what to believe. But I'm telling you not to believe anything. Stop believing anything. Dive deep within yourself. And yourself will guide you where you're supposed to be. And yourself will tell you what to do in every situation. Because yourself is omnipresence. Therefore, your being here with me is no accident. Because yourself is myself. There's one self. And you're here because you're supposed to be here. If you weren't supposed to be, you'd be somewhere else. <laughs> but you're here, so what can I do? <laughs> I never really invite anybody to these meetings. Henry does. <laughs> because it makes no difference to me. There's one person here, there's nobody here. There was a time when I used to talk to myself. I still do, but silently. To what end, and what, what was your reason for talking to you? Uh, your I was just confessing the truth to myself, yes. Usually I don't do anything, but sometimes I like to say something to myself. Because my soul gets lonely. It's lonely in there. <laughs> Not really. Robert, what did you mean that when you said earlier that we become Iswara? Because on um, the highest level, there is no Iswara, is there? No, that's why you become Iswara. Iswara, or God, has always been you. When you awaken, Everything merges into oneness. 
soon as war has become young. It always was. Always was, yes. But you've given it separation. As long as you give it separation, you run the law of karma. You can't help but give it separation. Why? Because it's the way we are. On the contrary. If we couldn't... There. If we couldn't help it, nobody would ever become like them. I, didn't, I, I understand that. I agree with you on that. But I'm saying the program, my well, say for me, is so strong that even what has happened to me still, I repeat over and over what happens, but sometimes something will happen that come to me that I have no control over. It, it just It just happens. Do you practice sadhana of any kind? Who? Sadhana, spiritual practices. Do I practice any spiritual? Oh, no. No. That's why. That's why? That's why things are like they are. I'm reading Wayne Dwyer. I think he's an incredible person. The psychologist, psychiatrist, Dr. Wayne Dwyer. I've seen his book. Yeah. Pardon? I've seen his book. Yeah. He wrote this latest one. It's when, when you believe it, you'll see it. That's the title and most people say, when I see it, I'll believe it, you know. Ed probably knows about this stuff, huh? But it, it doesn't make any difference. It can be to a psychologist or a meditation or to you. What will happen will happen. There's no, uh, there's no one to say how it's going to happen. This is true to an extent. But most people should practice some type of meditation and do something to themselves to help. Otherwise, you can say, I want to play the piano, but I'm not going to take any lessons. That's, that's not a good analogy. If it happens, it will happen. Why? Why? Mr. Gentleman, how many years you meditated? A long time. A long time. Years and years and years. I meditated too, and all I did was get a blank and a wall, and I said, I'm not going to do this, and I haven't. I'm only speaking for myself. Of course, I understand. Well, I'm not adverse or opposing you. I know. That's okay if you are. You have to look within yourself. That's where all the answers are. You have, to, you have to ask yourself the question, who has these feelings? What? Who has these feelings? To whom do they come? And you have to find your eye and discover who I is. See, so you've got to do something. There are very few people who do not have to do anything. Maybe you're one of them, I don't know. But like you say, if the years pass, and nothing happens from doing no thing, then get involved in some spiritual practice and give yourself over to it. Like bhakti, for instance. Devotion. Surrender your life to God and let God take care of all your problems. Give it all away to God. Are you willing to do that? Give everything to God. Let God carry this load and become free. Any more comments about them? I've known Nate for many, many, many years. I don't think there is a practice he hasn't practiced or a teacher he hasn't followed to a, a large degree. He's struggled. I've seen, watched him struggle for year after year after year, and he still feels a kind of frustration with the progress. I know him very well. He has really tried almost everything. Then don't give up. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Robert, when you say by all means, do something. Really, what he's saying is, do nothing. In the ultimate, you do nothing. 
So that's the whole process. But you have to realize that you are nothing first. And if you're confounded with all kinds of material things, you can't see that you. It seems so logical for me because I've done much meditation and um, coming across this path, the idea of self-inquiry, as you say, all things are attached to the self, to the I. And until we find out about this I, what is the use of practices, reading books, who's practicing, who's reading books, to what end? And that's the practice, to follow the I. But really, it's not, it's not so much practicing, it's not practicing, in a sense. You know, so I'm trying to make a point that as long as, well, I guess you can't make the point. I know what you mean. You meditate to learn that you don't have to meditate, in other words. Yes. You are that. Yes. But Nate, the whole problem is yourself. You've got to get yourself out of the way. And let the divine circuits take over. I am aware of all these things. In fact, I don't want to talk because sometimes people laugh. And, uh, Nobody laughs. Anyway, some of the people are afraid to ask questions and things like that. I'm aware of getting yourself out of the way. And then the music question, how do you get yourself out of the way? And there's no how. It's like going in a circle. You know? Then you should take one of the answers. One of what? Answers that you get and follow it through. Like when you get up in the morning, the first thing is to realize is I exist. And then you realize I slept. I dreamt, and now I'm awake and I exist. So who is the I that was present during the waking, sleeping, and dreaming? Mm -hmm. I. Well, I, I would like to, I'd like to say that in this book, I only read about half of it, Dwyer, he, he has made some connections, no doubt about it. He explains how he does it. But he explains how the waking dream and the sleeping dream are the same. And he does such a beautiful job that you think when you're reading it that you're that the waking dream and the sleeping dream are the same. It's just mm. it's really succinctly put. Well that's great. Does he tell you what to do to get there? Yeah, I'll tell you what happened since you asked me <laughs> since you asked me. I was read about half the book and I must be on some mailing list, but I received He's in Chicago, and I received, it said from Dr. Dwayne Dwyer, <clears throat> I'll send you six tapes, and uh, keep for 30 days. If you feel they're value for you, send me 30 dollars $40 approximately. If you don't, send the tapes back. Well, I've never heard anybody give a presentation like that, mm -hmm. so I call up an 800 number in Chicago, and I expect the tapes any day. I'm curious mm -hmm. you know, what they're like. You well, have something. That's good. As far as I can help. But in the last analysis, Nate, nothing can help you but yourself. You but know that's that. the self is the problem, since we're since I'm expounding. Then for whom is the problem? My ego, my searching, my wanting. Follow it through. We'd rather say the problem is for me. I have the problem. Okay. Then what is the source of the I? I've created the problem with wants or desires. You now follow the eye. All the things that you are saying, they're all attached to the eye. If you solve the mystery of the eye, everything else will go away with it. Because everything, the world, the body, the mind, are all attached to the eye. So when you ask the question, who am I? Or well, from whence do I come? Or well, what is the source of I? and you keep sound, mm. everything else will be diminished for your problems. It will go away with the eye. Oh, is that Gurdjieff expounding the different eyes? Perhaps, yes. Perhaps he was. But no matter who's expounding it, 
practice it, do it, make it happen. That's the whole thing. There are so many teachers, but you've got to be your own teacher. And you've got to work on yourself or do something until something gives way. No matter how long it takes, never give up. Did you get the tapes? No, they haven't come oh, yet. Still I will share them with the, you know, there will be some. He says you play them over and over, and each time you play them, you'll hear something different. You got the tapes playing over and over. Yeah, right, right. right. You're already saying. Okay. I won't deny that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Well, again, your being here is no accident. So let's see what happens to you. You've got my blessing. All is well. What difference does it make what happens to us if we do not react? <clears throat> the secret is just not to react. Come with me. And the only reason we get upset is because the world is not turning our way. That's right. That's true. And agrees. I absolutely. 100%. <clears throat> At least I got somebody who agrees with me. <laughs> <laughs> See what Shakespeare has said. Nothing is either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Therefore, when something happens to us of a negative nature, it's not because something bad has happened. That's just the way we see it. It's our perspective, our concept. We have preconceived ideas, what's good and what's bad. So we expect the good things, and we want to avoid the bad things. But the so-called bad things are just the other side of the coin of the good things. As long as you believe you are the body or the mind, you have to experience both, good and bad. Everybody does. You cannot avoid it. It's only when you stop reacting that you transcend your karma and you become totally free. What do you think of that? before, and the fastest way to become awakened is to stop the mind from thinking. There is no faster way. And the way you do that is by investigating your mind. Investigate what your mind is. You will soon discover it's nothing but a bundle of thoughts about the past and the future. And if you stop and watch those thoughts, observe those thoughts, become the witness of those thoughts, then you become silent. 
and the thoughts diminish. You ultimately become free. And that's the way to do it. Any questions? Can you witness? Is that possible? Do you there's a you witness and you that's not witnessing? In the beginning, you have to use your mind to destroy your mind. So you use your mind to witness. And then the witness goes from the mind to the self and observes everything and does not react. But in the beginning, you're using your mind. Like Romani used to say, it's like the policeman becoming a thief to catch the thief. So you use the mind in the beginning to subdue it. The mind as the ego mind. The ego mind. The ego. The ego and the mind is simultaneously as the like in the same thing. You simply observe your thoughts. You observe yourself thinking. You watch. You observe everything around you. You react to nothing. You just observe. And you keep doing this day after day, day after day, day after day. The mind energy begins to slow down. As the weeks and months go by, the mind slows down. Until the mind is conquered. Then you will realize there never was a mind to begin with. And you've been fighting nothing all these years. The mind is an optical illusion. It appears real, just like a dream appears real. So the mind appears real. And as long as the mind appears real, it projects and manifests the whole universe. Therefore, the whole universe, especially all of your affairs, are nothing more than a mind's projection. When you turn yourself inwardly and ask to whom do these things come, you will soon discover that there is no me and you will be free. Grab you. Seems like a lot of nonsense. That's what it is. No sense. Apparent <laughs> nonsense. No sense. Yeah, no sense. Thank you. There was never you were a separate you and me in the first place, so then all of us have gone through just to arrive at that obvious fact. Why not just awaken right now? Why not? And forget the whole thing. It's a great <laughs> idea, but it's an idea. Do it. Make it happen. Become centered. There is no past or future for you. 
And you are ultimate oneness. You're free right now. Accept it. Take it. It's yours. Enjoy it. Robert, I have a question. It seems to me that if if we accept the teaching and the practice, you said again and again you can pursue your ordinary life, except that you you pursue all of your activities with non-attachment, with mm. detachment, uh, and indifferent to what what happens. You said this many times, mm. but it seems to me that if you do this, if you if you go along with the teaching and the practice, that eventually it becomes very difficult to live in the world and that your physical world will change greatly and that uh, it's, it's almost impossible to, to, to pursue this life unless you have some type of, I've said this before, some type of organization, some type of support which allows you to persist in it. That's how it appears to you right now, but that's not true. As I mentioned before, your body is going to go through the motions and do whatever it came to the earth to do. But it has nothing to do with you. That's your body. When you awaken, you observe your body just like you observe everything else in the world. But you understand it's not you. And your body will go through the motions. So if you're going to be an artist, you'll become a great artist. If you're going to be a musician, you'll become a great musician. But you'll realize this has nothing to do with If you see a lot of evil in the world, you realize that you are sinning yourself. And you must ask yourself, to whom does this come? Who sees all this? And again, the answer will be, well, this all comes to me. Hold on to the me. Follow the me to the source. There is no sense. There is silence. And in that silence you become free and liberated. So the highest teacher is silence. Now remember when I speak of silence, I'm not referring to you just sitting still like a statue. Because when you're sitting still like a statue, your mind is still chattering away. I'm talking about silence in your mind, in your thoughts, quieting the mind, making the mind quiescent, calm, still by not reacting to person, place, or thing. Then you'll always be happy. If you don't react, you'll always be blissful. What do you think of that? Reaction is the activity of the notion of the self itself. Well, reaction is the activity of the mind. Same thing. Mm. Ego, mind, self, self. Uh, how do you turn? So ask yourself, to whom does this come? That's what you can do. Who reacts? I do? Well, who am I? What is the source of the I? 
and flowers to its culmination. Then you will realize that you've always been free, that there are no problems, there never were any problems, there never will be any problems. Simple. Why make it difficult? I'm not quite understanding how non-reacting re- relates to bliss. How we think it would relate more to, to nothing. Well, nothing is bliss. <laughs> the nothing that you're referring to is the ultimate reality. Absolute oneness. Close. Just nothing. And everything. When there is something, there's duality. Something is always duality. How is it? How is nothing different from a void? The void is the same as nothing. What Buddhism means by the void, they mean Buddhahood. Absolute bliss, nirvana, emptiness. They're all synonymous with bliss. I guess that's a nuance that in our culture we don't usually relate. Of course not. And that's why I always tell you, when someone says to you, you're good for nothing, say thank you. <laughs> We're not talking about human happiness. We're talking about unalloyed happiness. Happiness that comes from the self. A happiness that is everything, so it needs nothing. A happiness that is omnipresence. God. Power Brahman, complete total happiness that is foreign to us because we associate happiness with things and this is beyond things. There's something we cannot understand finitely. We have to close our eyes and go deep within to find that happiness. So it really requires a, a, an act of faith to continue self-inquiry for years and years. Since we can't conceive of it with the mind, and we're using the mind to try to conceive of it. That's really faith we're talking about. Isn't no, not really. It's act of a child, self-inquiry. We're not asked to believe anything. We're asked to ask ourselves, who is this body come to? Whose mind is this? To whom does it come? Who is going to a karma? Who is experiencing cause and effect? To whom does it come? That's what we're asked to do. Not to have faith in anything. Well, in a way, maybe it's just semantics, but it seems like you have to have faith that that will work. Um, it's more scientific. You just practice something and you see the result. You know, even even many of the books in the high school examples of people complain of having tried for years. Yes. And it's the point we talk about. So it's, it's obviously very common. Phenomenal. And you told them to continue. Mm-hmm. That's the kind of faith I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do. Yeah. Well, what you have to really do is analyze your life and look at your past and say, do I want to keep going through this again? No. <laughs> or do I want to go somewhere else? So you keep on practicing. <laughs> Thank you.
It also depends on whether you're practicing self-inquiry as part of a goal to reach some state, or for its own sake, because you don't trust anything else. Mm. That's and if you practice in self-inquiry just for the sake of self-inquiry, because you know you don't like the way things are, uh, it's an entirely different thing than practice again in order to gain enlightenment, which, mm. which sort of spoils the whole process. Yes. Because it's colored by the goal of attaining something. Very true. There are no goals due to the fact you can't attain anything that you already are. There's nothing to attain. It's just a waking up process. You just wake up. That's all. When I first read Nisargadatta, uh, for the first time I had utter faith in a teacher's teachings mm -hmm. in Advaita Vedanta. And when I read, met Robert, he shook me out of that faith. I've started self-inquiry again, and it's uh, it's they're complementary, but they're different. Mm. How are they different? One from Nisargadatta's point of view, it's like you accept that you're the absolute; you don't do anything. From Robert's point of view, you recognize you're still a limited human being and have the power to investigate that Iness, and that there is some something you can do. At least that's how I conceptualize what's happened to me. And I like the latter better because it, it feels more real. It's more of an acceptance of your of your limitations and your humanity as you are. And you, self-inquiry is more gentle than the kind of coldness that I felt with Nisargadatta. You just accept you're the absolute and pretend you're uh, you're God or you pretend you're Krishna, and then wait for enlightenment to come to you. There's a, there was a coldness that I had with that that I don't feel now. I didn't get that there was Nisha Gadada's teaching exactly. Like, because I know when people people who go to see Nisha Gadada yes. they would say things like, oh, I am God, I am God. Yes, I know. Get very angry at It's them. true. Now that I read Nisha Gadada, I, I read them very differently. <laughs> very different uh -huh. understanding now. It was yeah, Ramesh's yeah. Nisha Gadada yeah. that it. reminds me of Nisha Gadada. Yes. It reminds me of Nisha Gadada. Exactly. It's interesting how we can look at a book and then come back to it and get a different meaning completely. Yes. That's an example of this projection of the mind. Yes. It's just projecting the old Gentiles. This is why I say we should destroy all of our books and have no crutch whatsoever and lean on yourself. See what you are and where you are, and take it from there. When most people don't feel so hot, they feel out of sorts. They take out a book from the library shelf and they read something and they say, Oh no, I feel good. But the book becomes a crutch. Whether it's the Bible or whatever you read, you've got to become the living essence of the Bible. You've got to become the living essence of the book that you read. And you do that by contemplating yourself. Whenever you feel out of sorts, do not go to somebody external or take a book or anything like that. But simply ask yourself, who feels out of sorts? Who has these feelings? To whom do they come? And follow through. And the feelings will disappear along the cord.
interesting too, you know. It depends on what ears this falls on. In some ears, people get really sour when they hear this. <laughs> some, they smile. In most, it falls only once. Actually, the truth like a hammer, but it just hits you over and over again until it gets through. what Romano was like, something like you see been around Romano when he was alive. Could you say something a little bit about it? What can you say? It's like working in uh when I saw Romano I saw myself. But you also have said that you you asked immediately what you could do for him, so was that a love of self or a love of what he represented? I saw he has physical difficulties. So I asked what I can do for him. I just told me to be myself. Romano was like a rubber ball. His attendance is to just push him up the hills, carry him along, push him on the bed. And he just go along with everything. <laughs> well, that Amanda Mayama seemed sort of the same way. She was oh, all yes. serene and regardless of the clutter and the cluster around you know? it. And you see that way. You're always the same. And you don't you don't you your best example of not your husband. Did you have something to read? Narada always brings good things to read. He doesn't follow your advice and troll that stuff away. <laughs> 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 no, it takes up our time and there's always something to do. So we go home and say it was a long meeting. <laughs> Socrates has gripped the attention of the greatest seers 
sages and thinkers of all ages. It is the essential experience welling up from the hearts of yearning souls belonging to every country of the world and giving expression to it the terminologies, the words, and the language may differ but the essence and its content is the same. The command of Vedanta is Atmanam Vidi Know the Self In fact this experiential dictum is at the back of all Eastern religions. Though it is true that the basis of this dictum is too fundamental to be classified any under any philosophy or thinker or age, that is, knowing the knower is the aim of all spiritual striving in all ages and of all religions. Not to know the knower and yet to know all else is termed total ignorance. Hence, very great importance is given to knowing oneself. Know thyself is the same as know who you are, or asking, who am I, or seeking, whence am I. This ancient quest is the ground and fundamental teaching of Bhagavan Sri Ramana Maharshi. Simple being is the self said Maharshi. This being is consciousness. The very living principle of each one of us is this consciousness. Any form of awareness is embedded only in this vast expanse of consciousness. The triple principle dominating man's activities is called Vaiputi, comprising the knower the object known and the act of knowing occurs only in consciousness. Experiences are classified into us, avata, varaya, and the waking, the dreaming, and the deep sleep states, which also take place only in consciousness. Likewise, the pair of opposites, like right and wrong, good and bad, day and night, or Concepts like being and non-being get exposed only in the backdrop of consciousness. Thus consciousness is the ground or secret on which they play. While one is aware constantly and gets involved deeply in this drama, the basis or stratum on which the play takes place is totally forgotten. By whom? To turn one attention from the details or activities to the source of activity is called introspection. This turning inward is the beginning of spiritual effort called sadhana. Taking a right turn about, turn from uh, total consciousness is the positive key to open the gates to know oneself. Becoming conscious or aware of something else brings in the, the triple uh, tri triputi avaka saraya, but pure consciousness is pure awareness per se. It is the basis for all motion while remaining motionless, unaffected by any movement. Perhaps an analogy will help us understand consciousness as our basis. Electricity flows through a wire. It is invisible and intangible. When the electric bulb is connected to the wire, the lamp gets lit up. The color of the glass of the bulb determines the color of the light. When flowing through a fan, the current makes the fan rotate. Connected to a pump, it lifts water. The current flowing in all these cases is one and the same, but its effects are different. Similarly, 
when the pure light of consciousness passes through different physical, emotional, mental, and ego vestitures, it looks as though it is limiting itself by taking the color and texture of that particular vestiture. Since the bulb, fan, and pump are visible to the eye and not the electricity, the utility aspects engages one's attention, the root or the cause of the electricity being ignored. Likewise, man's activities ensnare him and make him forget his very nature as consciousness. When consciousness is confined to an individual or the body, it gets clouded by the manifestation. This descent results in the ego, the non-self, mistaking itself for the self. Conversely, ego fluctuating through the physical, emotional, and mental fields has the power to cloud or veil pure consciousness. Ego has no existence apart from the self, like the gold ornaments having no existence apart from the gold. But the self exists always. Ego is only a shadow of the self. It catches hold of the body and through it projects itself as the self. Thus ego thrives on in the world as conscious perceiver and enjoyer of the world. It hopes, it hops from one form to another since no form is permanent. Such impermanent movement is called the cycle of births and deaths. This limitation is technically termed samsara. Freedom from such bondage is called moksha, release back into total consciousness. Absolute release into pure consciousness is the ultimate goal of human life, the release from the ego. How to affect it? Through introspection, deep inquiry, atma vichara, self-inquiry. Release from the bonds of ego is gained. This is the process of who am I inquiry, the technique to know oneself. The bondage is the ego. The bondage is for the ego. Consciousness, conditioning or identifying itself into a body is this ego. <coughs> the ego exists, say the scriptures, due to non-inquiry, abhichara. This avichara is sustained and strengthened by ignorance. Consciousness is pure attention alone. When the attention is held, unmoved, there is no place for ego or non-attention. To hold the attention on itself, to dissolve or transform non-attention into total attention, total consciousness, the quest, who am I, is the vital process. To turn one attention on oneself is the essence of true knowledge. Such self-attention is the key to open the mystery, the mystery gates of the immeasurable treasure, knowing the knower. The knower known, there is none else, nothing else to be known. To remain as pure consciousness is the secret and meaning of know thyself. The Bhagavan Ramana put it all in a sutra aphorism. He summarized the whole process into four pregnant words, Diham, Naham, Koham, Soham. Diham, body symbolizing all objective and su subjective perceptions. Naham, I am not. Koham, who am I? Soham, I am consciousness. Rid of all vestiges, vehicles, masks, conveyances, and camouflages, pure consciousness alone will shine if the inquiry, who am I, is relentlessly pursued within. Such atma vichara releases one from the bondage. Release from bondage and drawing of wisdom are simultaneous, like the coming of light and ending of darkness are simultaneous. In this grand journey within, the Guru's grace is absolutely essential. For one who is ready to plunge within, the Guru's grace is totally assured. This grace is felt by one 
dedicating himself to the pursuit of self-inquiry through a deepening peace welling up in him, independent of life's circumstances. Thank you. These articles are written for the Ayani. They're very worthy. They're good, but they're worthy. For instance, when he says, consciousness takes up all form and becomes all forms. The question you should ask is, why? Where do the forms come from? That consciousness becomes all forms. Well, the highest truth is, there are no forms. There is no body. There is no mind. There is no world. There is no universe. There is no God. There is no coming and going. There is no ignorance. And there is no enlightenment. So why do we see it all? That's a mystery. It's an optical illusion. It does not exist. Go back to the dream state. When you dream, it becomes externalized. And in your small mind, a universe is created of people, places, and things. Why? It doesn't really exist. When you wake up, it does not exist. It's the same with this world. It appears real. We appear as bodies. There's a sun, there's a moon, there's an earth. There are trees, there are birds, there are ants. And they do not exist. No thing exists. Only the self, and you are that. This is the highest truth. The reason I, sh I share with you <clears throat> the various methods of meditation, the young meditations, is because those of you who are really involved in the world and your mind is always thinking, thinking, thinking. If you practice the meditation, your mind will begin to slow up. But let me ask those of you who have been practicing what has happened to you? Would you like to say? Anybody? Nobody's been caught to say. Well, you haven't been here before. We're speaking the young meditation is. That's okay. Well, my depression went away. I have twice as much, three times as much energy as before. Oh, and good. life seems more real, in a sense, rather than empty. That's a good sign. There's hope for you, yeah. <laughs> yeah. In some no. ways, I that prefer the depression. Yeah. No hope. <laughs> How do you mean life feels more? It seems more real. Uh, I feel my body more and feelings more, and uh, hmm. the reality seems much more sh clear and bright and. It was like in the old days when I used to practice meditation a lot. 
trees are beautiful and shining and the sky is very blue. So things are high. Yes, and I don't need any more. Anybody else? Remember on the path of Yana Yoga, Yana Yoga and Yana Marga, there's really no meditation involved. But there are some people who have to use it. As I said before, to clear your mind out. It causes your thoughts to decrease. There are three types of meditation is we'll share one right now. So make yourself comfortable. And close your eyes to remove obstructions. Forget about the world for a little bit. To relax you more, take 12 deep breaths from your diaphragm. This is. If you practice this form of meditation, preferably in the morning and the evening, it will help. Any questions about that? Remember to love yourself, to worship yourself, to pray to yourself, because God dwells in you as you. God does you in peace. And that's it.